Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, oh, see. No, no, it's great to be here. It's a great <laughs> But I am glad to be here. So, okay, I'm glad to be here. But remind me, I'm going to read some things and remind me to, um, uh, to uh, shout out the page number so they, to facilitate the captioning when I'm reading something. And I'm, I'm bound to forget. Um, when I go out to uh, talk about a book that's just come out, go around the country uh, spreading the glad news, um, I tend to figure out while I'm talking about it how I should have written it in the first place. Um, my um, people are always asking me, uh, I hate to bring this up, but I am because it, um, people ask, uh, when did you first realize you were funny? And um, it just doesn't seem to me to work like that. I don't know. Uh, it seems to me I was probably a pretty funny baby. Most babies are. <laughs> are pretty funny, um, some more than others, certainly. I've known enough babies to know that not every baby is really funny, but uh, it, babies tend to have their funny moments. Um, but so, and I tell people that I wrote a whole book about, about why I, I really hate to put this, but anyway, why I write humor. And um, I called it Be Sweet, and while I was going around talking about it, I realized I should call it, should have called it a Funny Way of Showing It, I think would have been a much better, <laughs> better title. And um, also, there are anecdotes in there, but I never quite uh, told this, the, for, the story I'm about to tell. I never quite told it in exactly the right way in the book. But, and here's the right way. Um, there was a big, I was living up in New York. I'd moved away. And uh, my sister announced to my parents that she was going to uh, Germany with a man that she was not married to. She was already, I don't know, 25 or something. She said, well, uh, but my mother went, got hysterical and threatened to kill herself and stuff, <laughs> yeah, well, which was no laughing matter. Um, and uh, so I decided, I was living in New York, and uh, they were down in Georgia, in the Atlanta area. And I flew down in the middle of the night and decided I was going to uh, work this out, all these family problems all these issues once and for all. We got in a big, long, loud, yelling fight amongst us, my sister and my father and my mother, and, um, but uh, in the kitchen, as it happened. And uh, of course, it just made things worse. We never really resolved anything. And, uh, but um, at one point, my mother said, you have uh, cut out my heart and stomped on it on the kitchen floor. And it occurred to me later that if I had added just a little bit, you, you have cut out my heart and stomped on it on the kitchen floor that I just finished mopping. <laughs> it would be funny. And um, that's pretty much, I'm generally doing my mother just pushed one, one, one point further. Um, but my mother was a great cook. And um, she actually, I had an eating issues when I was a kid. Apparently, I don't remember, but she used to tell me that I nearly starved to death the uh, first three years of my life. For some reason, I refused all nourishment. And she would, do, she would try to force food into my, you know, here comes the baby food in the, in the airplane. I don't know. And uh, it just drove her crazy. Finally, she, she um, let up and uh, just let me eat for myself. And I became a big eater, and I loved her, her cooking. And so uh, when people ask me why I would write a book about food, I'd go right back to the, my original trauma and uh, the uh, deliciousness that followed the trauma. Um, and it just seems to me a natural thing to write about food. For one thing, um, I'm an oral writer in lots of ways. I think Southerners, Southern writers tend to be oral and tend to enjoy the sound of words and enjoy the uh, notion of words being things that move through the mouth. I've written a couple of books called Alphabet Juice and Alphabetter Juice, which uh, go into all that a lot. But um, food certainly is an oral thing, and therefore it seems a natural thing for me to write about. Uh, I wrote a, a, a poem about oysters once, uh, which goes like this. I like to eat an uncooked oyster. Nothing's slicker, nothing's moister. Nothing's easier on the gorge or when the time comes to discharge. 
but not to let it too long rest within your mouth is always best. For if your mind dwells on an oyster, nothing's slicker, nothing's moister. <laughs> I prefer my oyster fried, then I'm sure my oysters died. <laughs> I'm going to come back to oysters uh, a little bit later, which uh, belies the whole thing. I love uh, raw oysters, but you know, you got to write what you got to write. Um, and here's a, I figured to clear out if there are any sort of uh, uh, halfway uh, lovers of Southern food among you, I figured this will uh, clear you all out by uh, a piece I wrote for Garden and Gun about okra, which is on page um, 122, 123, 124 of this book about okra phobia. When the rock, rock and roll band of authors known as the Rock Bottom Remainders get together, got together recently, I learned that my friend and bandmate Stephen King is horrified by okra. Someone, not me, maybe Greg Isles, the only other Southern member of the band, happened to bring up okra just in passing, you know, as you will. And Steve reacted as if another person might react to a vengeful psychokinetic wallflower, or a runaway rabid St. Bernard, or an insanely jealous Plymouth Fury. No, he said, I don't want okra, no okra, no. Not an unusual response among people who didn't grow up with okra, also among quite a few who did. Even the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary sounds unsettling. Quote, a five-sided pod, actually a capsule, harvested when immature and mucilaginous. <laughs> also called ladies' fingers. To me, there's nothing much more savory than cross sections of okra dusted with a cornmeal and crispy fried. But I like okra boil, too. Jerry Clower said the longest dog fight he ever saw was over okra. At his mama's behest, Jerry dumped a pot full of boiled down leftover okra into the dog pen. A big old hound run up there, and it just went down so fast he thought the other dog got it. <laughs> and jumped on him. Them dogs fought the whole rest of the evening and didn't but one dog know what they were fighting about. <laughs> okay, okra is slick, but can't we appreciate slick? Ernie K. Doe, according to Ben Sandmel's biography of the singer of Mother-in-Law, was proud to say, I'm so slick, grease gotta come ask me how to be greasy. In GQ recently, an MC named Two Chains was quoted as observing, that, quote, Atlanta people always say slick when we really mean it. It's slick hot outside. <laughs> okra gets a bad rap, says Poppy Tooker, author of the Crescent City Farmer's Market Cookbook on YouTube, where she demonstrates, quote, how to keep okra from getting slimy. You fry it in hot, hot oil. Someone from the Philippines has posted a comment. If you don't want your okra to be slimy, then go pick another vegetable, vegetable because it is made that way. <laughs> also on YouTube, Sarah Sawadogo, slickly hot in a little black off-the-shoulder dress and three strands of pearls, shows us, quote, how to cook okra the most delicious way. If the gumbo she stirs up involving octopus looks a little questionable, she sells it by tasting it so well. Mmm and then shouting, I see my grandmother. <laughs> Comments range from, quote, I am from Louisiana, I love okra, it's good for the body, and yours look delicious. To most delicious way, are you crazy? Look whoever taught you to cook okra soup this way have wronged you big time, Miss Lady. Nonsense. And then another commenter, ha commenter has to blurt out, dirty, nasty, stankin'. Which bears out what another member of the Rock Bottom Remainders, Matt Groening, remarked when we were all in Los, Los Angeles together. Quote, never read online comments because about the fifth one down will make you hate all humans. <laughs> but okra runs deeper than commentary. In Ghana, okra is not only a dietary staple, but essential in other ways. There's a reggae hop band called okra, and a singer called Okra Tom David, and the word for a mess of okra is nekrumah, 
the name of Ghana's founder, Kwame Nkrumah. Ghana's dominant ethnic group is the Akan people. They believe, according to the Encyclopedia of African and African American Religions, that one of the three major spiritual components of a person is, quote, the immaterial divine spark from God that is immortal and so vital that life cannot be sustained without it. And the word for that, quote, soul from God is okra. <laughs> if a person is faced with intense disgrace or attacks by evil, says that encyclopedia, the okra is believed to react by temporarily leaving the person. In such a situation, certain rituals are required in order to restore the okra. I like the notion of, say, John Edwards having to woo his okra back. <laughs> I don't like thinking of the soul as slimy, but slick, yeah. And this, uh, I'll follow that up with a song to okra, which is on page 121 of the book. String beans are good, and ripe tomatoes, and collard greens, and sweet potatoes, sweet corn, field peas, and squash, and beets. But when a man rears back and eats, he wants okra. Good old okra. Oh, wow, okra. Yes, siree. Okra is okay with me. Oh, okra's favored far and wide. Oh, you can eat it boiled or fried, or either, oh, either slick or crisp inside. Oh, I once knew a man who died without okra. Little pepper sauce on it. Oh, I want it. Okra. Old Homer Ogletree's so high on okra, he keeps lots laid by. He keeps it in a safe he locks up. He eats so much, can't keep his socks up. <laughs> Which goes to show it's no misnomer when people call him okra Homer. Okra. Oh, you can make some gumbo with it, but most of all, I like to get it all by itself in its own juice, lying there all green and loose. That's okra. It may be poor for eating chips with, it may be hard to come to grips with, but okra is such a wholesome food, it straightens out your attitude. You can have strip pokra. Give me a nice girl and a dish of okra. Mmm <laughs> is how discerning folkra spawn when they are served some okra. That's one of those rhymes that come to us once in a lifetime. <laughs> uh, this uh, book also includes, I, for the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me uh, po program, which I'm going to be on again this uh, weekend, um, uh, we write, the panelists write little fake news stories called the Bluff the Listener uh, segment. Which, and the listener is supposed to try to guess which one is the real, true news story. And I have noticed that lots of mine involve food, or at least eating things. For instance, this. What do folks ingest these days when they're raving all night to techno pop? Benzodioxylmethylpropanamine. Popularly known as Molly, or so I am told. But if an extra oxygen molecule slips in there, you've got benzo trioxyl, the accidental offshoot known as O Molly. Whereas Molly makes you feel all ecstatic and rubbery, O Molly induces an intense craving for weepy old Irish ballads. <laughs> Understandably, O'Malley has caused havoc on club dance floors. <laughs> when you're gyrating to electro clash with the laser lights and all, the last thing you want is people standing there glaring at you and crooning Danny Boy. <laughs> or worse. According to a study issued this week by the Drug Enforcement Administration, no fatal overdoses of O'Malley have been O'Malley have been reported, but a Boston DJ was beaten and thrown through a plate glass window for refusing to sample My Cheek on Mother's Tattered Shawl, <laughs> a song virtually impossible to twerk to. <laughs> oh, I, did I forget to do the page number? This is another one of those uh, bluff the listener things, fake news stories. Page 218, 218. It doesn't, I'm wait a little bit. It doesn't take long for a small morsel of fatty pork to pass through a duck. <laughs> it doesn't even take that long. It'll take you to read that sentence, actually. Alton Emery of Canardia, New Hampshire, who has, who has ducks, noticed this, and it gave him an idea for a surefire viral video. He tied a piece of fatty pork to a greased length of twine and placed it in his duck yard, and soon he had a string of ducks. <laughs> the 
going on with their lives unruffled because Emory allowed for adequate slack. <laughs> but the video footage, four ducks, then five ducks, then six, didn't look like much. And the local Humane Society got wind of his project. project. Last week, as Emory stood in the yard arguing with the Humane Society guy, an eagle swooped down, grabbed the sixth duck, and flew off with the whole string. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, as the other five ducks, one at a time, slid down the string, fell through the air, and landed on his pond, Emory's camera was in the house. <laughs> I don't think either of those was chosen by the uh, caller as he real, <laughs> but you never know. Um, I, uh, this book doesn't, you know, people want to know what, like always when you write a book, people want to know, what am I supposed to take away from this book? Uh, and I don't want you to take anything away from it, really. I mean, uh, I put all this stuff in there. <laughs> um, but if I have to have a theme, it is uh, that you know, the first three uh, french fries or potato chips are the good ones. And after that, you're just stuffing your face. Right? <laughs> now, there are two ways you can deal with that. You can either um, say to yourself as you're reaching for the fourth potato chip, you don't really want that, but you're going to eat that, aren't you? You're going to just make yourself fat and just go ahead. All right, that's it. That's, that's the kind of person you are. <laughs> And if you do that, you'll be saying to yourself, you're not the boss of me. You know, and you'll be <laughs> or you can say to yourself, let's save room for a pie, <laughs> which is the title of the book. And uh, uh, it seems like, a, I mean, it is something I believe in. Uh, on the other hand, I also quote in this book, Satchel Paige, who once, I, was, I went to a bowling uh, tournament for a, for sickle cell anemia that uh, Satchel was sponsoring, and, uh, and I saw Satchel eating fried chicken. And I said, uh, Satchel, you, uh, you, I thought you said that uh, you should avoid fried foods because they angry up the blood, which was, in fact, a quote that had been attributed to Satchel. And he said, I said, avoid them. I didn't say I avoided them. <laughs> So with that in mind, uh, the theme of the book is Save Room for Pie. Um, let's see. This is, uh, this is a piece that kind of g gets back into my childhood. It's on page 79 of the book called More to a Chicken. We hear much about the dignity, mystery, and vulnerability of more alien, not to say less upfront animals and aspects of nature. Chickens we chew on or chuckle over. Either a chicken sandwich or a rubber chicken may strike us as more essentially representative of what it is to be a chicken than a living chicken is. Yet the chicken, when granted a free range, granted a free range life, I hope you got that in the caption, a chicken, which grant, when granted a free range life, is as close to man and as savory as the apple, as full of itself as the lynx or the rose. A hen's feathers feel downy but organized when you lift her up. She has a peck like a catcher's snap throw to first. A chicken never makes eye contact with a person. Who is to say why it crosses the road? Or which came first, chicken or egg? This is one of those questions like, do the same tastes really taste the same to different people? And if so, in what sense? Or if you watched an area of your skin steadily for several hours while coming down with chicken pox, could you discern the exact moment when a given pock appeared? And if not, why not? If you could get inside another person's head, would you know it or would you think you were that person? <laughs> One of those questions, I mean, that people have with mounting ir irritation been wanting the answer to since early childhood. So I say the chicken came first. If the egg had been first, the chances are that Adam or Eve or one of the beasts of the field, even one of the beasts of the air, whatever was around then, would have at least broken and probably eaten the egg. We have no, of how, no way of knowing how many projected species were nipped off because they made the mistake of starting as eggs. 
I assume that the chicken came first and evaded ingestion long enough to lay several dozen eggs. Also, if the egg came first, then what fertilized it? In fact, the egg must have come third. How come a chicken, asked Roger Miller, can eat all the time and never get fat in the face? <laughs> Great Roger Miller. I was here uh, when Roger Miller was on the Prairie Home Companion. I was backstage with him, and uh, he was saying things like, uh, I got to catch a second wind. Uh, I broke the first one. <laughs> one, one time he was uh, stopped by the police, and the highway patrolman said, uh, can I see your license? And uh, Roger said, can I shoot your gun? <laughs> Seemed like a deal to him. Uh, all right, never get fat in the face. I don't know. I do know that of all the great fried chicken I have eaten, my mother's rolled in flour and dropped in hot shortening and hot heavy iron skillet at just the right time for just the right length of time was the best. It was crisp without being encrusted. In her fried chicken, you couldn't tell where the crust left off and the chicken began. In the comic books, they talked about caviar and pheasant under glass. I accepted these things as literary conventions, but in my thoughts they did not crunch, give, tear, bloom brownly. The richest brown or auburn in the synesthesial spectrum is well-fried chicken. Once in Baltimore, I heard Blaze Starr ask an audience whether they would like her to uncover entirely her larger-than-life bosoms. When the audience cried out, yes, yes, ma'am, they certainly would, I, said, I don't know why I say they certainly would. We certainly would. <laughs> she froze, rolled her eyes, replied with great pungent reserve, I reckon you would like some fried chicken. <laughs> the leg and the thigh, which we used to call with no conscious, conscious prudery the drumstick and the second joint, are juicier, however, than the breast, which, interestingly, has never been known, I believe, by a dinner table euphemism. I read this uh, last night in Decatur, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, oh, there was a euphemism for breast. We called it white meat. And one time, uh, 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 Winston Churchill was at uh, some southern people's home and was served uh, chicken, and he said, oh, what a lovely breast of chicken. And they said, and they said uh, Mr. Churchill, we don't say breast, we say white meat. <laughs> and so when Churchill went back to England, he... Uh, mailed the hostess a gift, which was a brooch. And he said, please pin this on your white meat. <laughs> it's a story I never heard. And most stories about Churchill are, uh, are made up. But uh, <laughs> so I learned something last night, uh, whether, you, whether it was true or not. Um, I've forgotten where I was. Uh, Oh, yeah. The, uh, and the sweetest pieces may not be the fleshiest. The wishbone destroyed in most commercial cutting and the little drumstick, as we call the meatiest part of the wing, are both delicacies. So is the heart, which tastes a little like blood and a little like cardboard. <laughs> but when chicken is fried right, the tastiest meat of all, delicate, chewy, elusive, is between the small bones of the breast, chicken rib meat. I am the only person I have ever known to mention this meat. Fried chicken is a personal experience, like the woods outside your house. But look for the rib meat. It's worth the trouble. When I was about 12, I got for Easter a baby chick that had been dyed pink. I now deplore the practice of dyeing chicks and ducklings, but this chick thrived and made a good pet. Some people don't believe this, but before all the pink had grown out of it, this chicken was already running around in the yard after me like a puppy. I used to carry it around in my shirt or my bicycle basket. I'm not going to say what its name was. You can't win telling what you named a chicken. <laughs> the reader's reaction will be either, that's not a funny name for a chicken, or he had a chicken with a funny name for, for a chicken. Big deal. I didn't really love it the way you love a dog or a cat, but I really liked it, and it liked me. I would think that would be embarrassing being followed by a chicken. My then brother-in-law, Gerald, said once, no, said my sister Susan, that chicken liked him. But the chick grew into a pullet. It didn't look right and might have been illegal to have a chicken in our neighborhood. And we didn't have the facilities for it. We didn't want the facilities for it because at our previous house, we had kept chickens in quantity, six. 
in and around a chicken house, and my father was soft-hearted about wringing their necks. That is, he would try to wring their necks in a soft-hearted way. When I asked my mother for details, she wrote, the chicken house was there complete with rather sad-looking and unproductive chickens when we bought the house. There was a rooster and five supposedly hens. Terrible thing to say about chicken. The people we bought the house from had had them because of the war and food shortage. I was sorry they were there. Daddy was glad. You were delighted with them. It also smelled bad, and I hated cleaning it. So did Daddy, and we tried to outweigh each other. You can guess who won most often. We finally decided two eggs a week were not worth it. The chickens didn't look too healthy. Then, too, they were all named. And after one trial, we decided we couldn't eat them and gave them to a colored man. That's a little dated reference. The one trial was by Daddy. He assured me he could kill a chicken. His mother always wrung their necks, etc. And he had watched. He violently, violently wrung the neck, you were not told, real hard and threw the chicken to the ground. It lay stunned and then wobbled drunkenly off to the chicken house. <laughs> we spent the rest of the week nursing it back to health. <laughs> when those chickens were gone, the chicken house remained. It was made of scrap lumber and tar paper. I used it as a fort, a left center field pavilion, and a clubhouse for a while, but by the time I was 12, I had gotten off into other things. Um, and my mother hated the chicken house. She said it ruined our backyard. She said she burned it down by accident. <laughs> One afternoon, she was raking leaves and burning them, and the fire spread to the chicken house. When Mrs. Hamright, out watering her bushes across the street, smelled smoke and heard the sirens coming, her reflex was to yell, oh dear Lord, and squirt the hose through the window of her house onto her husband, <laughs> Gordy, who was inside reading the paper. We eventually had to give him our copy of that evening's paper. <laughs> Mr. Lovejohn, the old man who lived with his middle-aged daughter next door to the Hamrites, and whom we ordinarily never saw, except when he was sitting in his daughter's DeSoto, early on Sunday morning waiting for her to get dressed and drive him to Sunday school and church, came over in his dark brown suit at about the same time the firemen started thrashing around with the hoses. He said he wanted to, quote, counsel with us. He said fire was the wages of smoking in bed. Now, Mr. Lovejohn, my mother said, no one in our family smokes anywhere, and there aren't any beds in the chicken house. That don't excuse it, he said. <laughs> By the time the firemen got there, the uh, chicken house was about gone, but they stretched hoses all over the back and side yards trampled a young dogwood tree, and eyed our house as if they would love a chance to break some windows. We didn't have many fires in our area at that time for some reason. This, is, this, is, this was an early thing I wrote under the influence of James Thurber. Now that particularly sounds like a Thurber sentence to me. We didn't have many fires in our area at that time for some reason. And the fire department was accustomed to igniting abandoned, abandoned structures, often chicken coops, in fact, on purpose and putting them out for practice playing them along for maximum, maximum exercise. Mrs. Hamright kept trying to get one of the firemen to tell her whether the fire was under control. I think he hated to admit that it was. Finally, he turned around and asked her, what do they have in there? Chickens, she said. Yeah, hit them rascals with a hose, they'd take off. My parents didn't want to go through all that again, so he gave our pet chicken to Louisiana who came every Wednesday to iron and clean and yell, you better not believe that man, child, at the female characters in the soap operas. <laughs> and who received a lot of things we didn't know what to do with. The chicken was getting too big, I could see that. Having a grown chicken as a pet would have been strange. How is the chicken, Susan and I would ask Louisiana on subsequent Wednesdays. Oh, fine, Louisiana would say. But when we said we wanted to visit it, she said she had let it go see her granddaughter who lived 80 miles away. <laughs> Does she play with it lots, we asked. She said she did. <laughs> Chicken. Um, let's see. Um, I'm gonna now read a couple of things. I, uh, told him I was going to read. Um, well, hmm. I don't know where anything is in this book. You'd think I didn't write this book. <laughs> oh, here's another oyster thing I was talking about. This is on page 112. 
I'm at Felix's Oyster Bar, across from each other on Iberville Street. This is in New Orleans. Iberville Street are two venerable oyster bars, the Acme and Felix. You are either an Acme, Acme person or a Felix person. I am a Felix person. New Orleans oysters are big, hardy fellows from the brackish waters where the river approaches the Gulf. When the river has been low, they have more flavor because their habitat has been saltier. But you can't tell a Felix oyster from an Acme one. And there's often a line outside the Acme, whereas you can all, almost always walk right into Felix's and lean against the place where the shuckers are shucking and call for a dozen and an Abita amber beer. Okay, so there I am in Felix's alone, eating them as they're shucked and working the New York Times crossword. The Saturday one, which is the hardest. And the shucker is condescending to talk to me. They won't, always. Generally, people in service occupations in New Orleans are happy to talk to you as if they'd known you for years. I got picked up by an Uber rider. We have a house now in New Orleans. I got picked up by an Uber driver uh, the other day, and uh, I was limping out. I got this bad leg. I was limping out, and my wife was watching me get in the cab, and the driver said, don't worry, I'll treat him like he was mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the shuckers and Felixes I have found to be a taciturn lot. Then, too, I've had long conversations with them in which the only word I understood was shuck. But this one is telling me about a man who he heard ate 48 dozen oysters one night, 48 dozen oysters one night over at the Acme. I don't even know if he leaves the shells, he said. Is he fat? I inquire. Half my intention is on the crossword. Yes, but not extraordinarily fat, about my height with your stomach. That's when I had a bigger stomach. <laughs> and in comes Becca with husband. I know her name is Becca and he is her husband because he says, oh, Becca. And she jerks her thumb over at him and says, my husband, cow. It's late fall, crisp for New Orleans, and she's wearing a sweater, striped horizontally, which on a flat surface would be straight across. But on her, the effect is topographical. <laughs> Shuck us a dozen, she tells the shucker. And with a look over at hubby, let's hope one of them works. If I had not, if I had not seen double, double indemnity enough times to be all too familiar with how these things turn out. Because here she is over close to me now saying, I work that puzzle every damn day of this world. In fact, I had just been reading how it was in New Orleans that Walker Evans, the great photographer, fell in love with the woman who had eventually become his wife, though he disappointed her in New Orleans by leaving town after her husband brandished a gun at him. One look at Becca and I'm into a noir narration frame of mind, thinking to myself, you know, a man has always got to be promoting getting some, and a woman has always got to be promoting get, getting something out of giving some up. But a woman who has given you, this is not, it's not my own sexual politics, I think it's clear, it's just this noir narration thing, giving some up. But a woman who has given you some to get back at her husband can just enjoy it and let you enjoy it because her ulterior motive is covered. Problem would be when she gets her message through to the husband, gets tired of that and starts figuring out how you two are letting her down. I'd say Becca's daddy had money till she got halfway through high school and he lost it all. Daddy's girl whose daddy folded. And now this husband, Kyle, a weedy sort. He nods distantly, looking like he hopes it's not coming across as miserably. And two kettles on the rocks, she says. And he says, oh, Becca, again. They're both fairly sloshed, but he's fading and she is on the rise. <laughs> she looks at my puzzle. A little hard to find? How many letters, she says. She's up against my shoulder looking at the puzzle. Husbands leaning against the counter, studying the first oyster shucked for them. Without moving away from me or looking away from the puzzle, she reaches over, takes the oyster from in front of her husband, puts it to her lips, gives me a little half look, and slurps it down. I say eight letters. She says, a good man. No, but where's the little in that? A woman who was just in it for the giggles would have made a coy face and said, I'm not touching that one. Becca gives me another half look, grabs my pen, and starts writing a good man in. That doesn't appeal to me on one level. On another, it brings her up against me even closer. She smells like her corsage. 
they're in town for the weekend for a football game, game from somewhere in Mississippi. And like her lipstick, maybe, which is certainly red enough to be aromatic, especially now that it is set off with a fleck of horseradish. <laughs> no, I say a good man can't be right. See, 14 down, Greek love would be agape. And she looks at me with both eyes and rolls them. Oh, I don't think so, hon, she says. Let's just jam it in there. We'll make it fit. She writes agape in so that the E is on top of the N. <laughs> she slurps another oyster. That fleck of horseradish is still there on her lip. I could reach over and flick it off for her, or I could point to the same spot on my own lip so she could get it, get it off herself, but I don't do either. Now she has one of my oysters. Slurps is too blatant. She takes it in juicily. Now she's filling things in my puzzle in willy-nilly, free association and spontaneity being the key, more than strict interpretation or even, in some cases, the right number of letters. <laughs> I am far more tolerant of this than I would be in other circumstances. You know we could do this all evening, she says, and in spite of my reserve, I'm beginning to have the same thought. At this time, I am unattached, and I am not thinking as sharply as back there in that noir narration frame of mind. But there's Kyle. She turns to him and said, me and this man could do this all evening. Keep on doing it till another puzzle comes out. She takes the last of their dozen. Kyle doesn't do the puzzle, she says. Kyle could eat every goddamn oyster in New Orleans. He still couldn't do the puzzle. Let's go, Kyle. Put some money down. He does, and my weight sags just a little bit farther than I'd prefer in the direction of her abruptly removed shoulder. Becca and Kyle turn to go her arm in his, but she looks back long enough to lick the fleck of horseradish off, finally, and to say, by way of farewell, they like it when you dog them out. I look at my puzzle, which is a mess, and I don't say anything. They like it, says the shucker. Um, I guess I could follow that up with some food limericks. I like to write spicy limericks. And... Uh, and uh, I, find, I found that lots of them, nobody ever wants to pu publish verse, light verse. So I've got a lot of it piled up at home, and a lot of them seem to involve food. So I put them in this book, <laughs> just to give you a little insight into the creative process. I can't find them now, but look, 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 here it is. A good cook otherwise, Ella, poo-pooed so-called salmonella till during her Jethro's consequent death throes, it struck her she'd need a new fella. <laughs> um, a bait shop proprietor, Kate, tells Randy Fisherman, wait just a damn minute. You're a boat, go get in it and fish, cause I ain't the bait. <laughs> there once was a lady named Dot who said as we found a nice spot, I never undress at a picnic unless it's warm, and it is, so why not? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Tonight, says my vegan friend Blanche, I'll be serving myself root and branch, and you can be guessing which mode of undressing, French, Thousand Island, or ranch. A lady I know named Elaine finds all endeavors inane, but fucking and cooking. If you think I'm looking for anyone else, you're insane. <laughs> now I'll tone it down a little bit, get off and back into the, back into the food stuff. Um, it, as I say, the book's called Leave Room for Pie, so there's lots of pie stuff in here. Um, there's a little piece, Mark Twain had a very sexy and crazy and dubious dream about pie that he wrote about in his uh, in a notebook. And nobody, everybody's sort of steered clear of that. But I wrote about it. But I'll let you read, it, read that in the book. Um, here, this is the quest for pie. The quest for pie. This is on page, I don't know, page 267. One afternoon, I was in the library of a small town in Mississippi in need of some informa information. So I went up to the lady behind the desk there. Ahead of me were an elderly white man and a young black woman. The elderly man was saying, just hit me 
suddenly, you know, that I wanted something. And then, then it hit me what it was that I wanted. It was pie. <laughs> well, said the lady behind the desk, a piece of pie. It's funny, because usually I don't want pie this time of day. But I did. That's exactly what it was that I, that I wanted, a piece of pie. But I couldn't think who would have pie this time of day. Mm-hmm, said the librarian. Miss Boyd, of course, serves extremely fine pie. But of course, Miss Boyd wouldn't be open. I was going to say, said the librarian, this time of day. So I said to myself, I said, now, Walter, where in town would they be liable to know where a body could get a piece of pie? Mm-hmm, said the librarian, looking thoughtful, this time of day. I said, well, i tell you where somebody is liable to know, at the library. So I told myself what I would do would be just to just come on over here. And I declare, Mr. Owsley, the librarian raised her voice. I order, a faint voice replied from back in the stacks. Uh-huh. Do you know where Mr. Owsley could get a piece of pie? You mean this time of day? <laughs> At that point, the young black woman stepped forward and said, excuse me, but do you have anything about the army? Because I got to get out of this damn town. <laughs> I, re I realize I have run long here, so let me do this uh, on page uh, 18. This is uh, uh, the way folks are meant to eat. When I was growing up in Georgia, we ate till we got tired. Then we went, whew, and leaned back and wholeheartedly expressed how much we regretted that we couldn't summon up the strength right then to eat some more. And people I grew up with talked while they ate about what they were eating. We moved over to page 19 now. When several sides and generations of a family of such folks sat down together around a table with 10 or 12 generous platters in front of them, they sounded something like this. And us to thy service, amen. Pitch in. I don't know where to start first. Mmm, mmm. Big mama has outdone herself tonight. Well, I just hope y'all can enjoy it. <laughs> I believe I could eat a horse. Would you look at them tomatoes? Ooh, don't they look good. Now, Tatum, slow down. You let that child enjoy himself. Well, you think we didn't feed him at home? He didn't get any snap beans. Lord, pass that child some snap beans. <laughs> Lila, how about you over there? You need something or butter beans. Ooh, ooh, land, no, I'm working on this corn. Come on, just a dab. Well, you talked me into it. Mmm. Mm. Awful early to be getting this good of corn. Eunice, would you send that okra back around? Look at me, just a putting it away. I'm eating like a field hand. A little more tea to wash it down. Mmm, mmm, these greens. Anybody want anything? Well, I will have one more helping of that squash if nobody minds. It's so good. A little cornbread to sop that juice. One more mouthful of ham. Then I do have to stop, sure enough. <laughs> Look at all this chicken left. Have a little more there, Charles. Where would he put it? Yes, I mean, just a spoonful of that gravy to put on my peas. Charles, we didn't raise you to mix your gravy with your peas. <laughs> See you, now you let that child eat the way he likes it. Mmm, mmm, mmm. More rolls, anybody? I think this is all I can hold. You better eat some more of this good chicken. No, I got to save room for pie. Pie, there's pie. Oh, listen, pie. Now, Needy, you know good and well we wouldn't let you go home and tell people we didn't serve you any pie. Look at that pie. 
what is in this pie? This pie is so good. Uh, mm, mm. How do you get your crust to do like this, big mama? My crust won't do like this. Oh, your crust does fine. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Mmm, mmm. Well, I have eaten myself sick. Mmm, <laughs> mmm. Wasn't that good? I don't think I could touch another bite. I'm about to pop. Mmm. Yes, Lord. Them tomatoes were especially good. Got plenty more now. I could slice right up. No, no, I'd die. There you go. So. <laughs> so I hope I saved enough room for questions. Anybody got any questions about what we have covered so far? Uh, let me put my glasses on so I can see you. Come on. You're, you know, I know you have questions. You're just embarrassed to ask them. Were you the head of the swimsuit uh, edition when you were at Sports Illustrated? Question is, was I the head of the swimsuit edition when I was at Sports <laughs> Illustrated? No. <laughs> um, I was uh, never even. I, I never even got to go on that store. Go out on that, one of those islands and take and watch uh, the photographer take pictures of uh, people wearing, frankly. Not very much clothes. Is that that's what you're that edition is? That's the one you're talking about. Um, no, I never got. I never did the swimsuit edition. So now they've taken just as painting the suits on them. I believe <laughs> they don't even have suits on. And they had uh, some. A woman every now and then will tell me, uh, why don't they have men in the swimsuits in the Sports Illustrated issue? And I always say, there's an idea. But I don't really go back to the magazine with it. I figure that I don't want to see it, but uh, of course, some people do. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing it. You know, I'm not saying that uh, I would be shocked to see a man in a brief swimsuit <laughs> or that it would bother me or anything, or, but uh, I just don't think it would sell many magazines. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Roy Bullets. Hey, hey, Bullets, how you doing? I saw Snake Grace yesterday. That's Snake Grace. He said to tell you hello. And All you can use his name anytime you want in your next book. Good. <laughs> That's Bullets Gillespie. We were Sigma Chi's together, and uh, Snake Grace was also, he played basketball. He was tall and had a, just a wonderful name, Snake Grace. Um, I have mentioned his name in the past as someone who also, uh, I knew a whack colonel in the Army named Ariel, like the sprite Ariel in Shakespeare, Ariel Stout. Uh, yeah. What is your favorite pie? My favorite pie? I have, there's so many fine pies that I don't have any particular favorite, but some, I am a pie person. Uh, somebody said, uh, uh, told me the other day, there are cake people and pie people. And I'm, no, I'm I don't, I like cake, but uh, pies, and somebody said there are also, uh, cake people and pie people are divided like robot people and monkey people. And that seemed to be pushing it a little far. I guess the cake, I don't care much for robots or monkeys, so I don't know why. I just pass that on as a bit of lore. It, yeah. Growing up in Decatur, does Waffle House feature into any of your food lore? Uh, I wrote something once about Waffle, Waffle House. I wrote some songs, but I forgot. You know, there, there are Waffle House songs on the Waffle House uh, jukebox, and lots of them, too. Uh, and I wrote a Waffle House song, but I'm afraid I don't remember it right now. Yeah, Waffle House. I ate there, but now, of course, Decatur. I grew up in Decatur. It's my hometown, and, I, and you're supposed to go back to your hometown and think, oh, what a quaint little hamlet, you know. But Decatur has, has outstripped me in the hip department. It's very, uh, it's got every kind of, of food and uh, drink. We didn't use, there were no drinks uh, served in Decatur uh, publicly for the length of my childhood. But now you can get any kind of drink, and they're you know, it's like. But meanwhile, Southern food has moved north. Uh, pimento cheese finally made it. Pimento cheese was the last thing to move north. Um, <laughs> people didn't. Know, we used to. Uh, there's a thing in here about uh, trace the the uh, the. Uh, 
movement of Pimento Cheese North, Pimento Cheese North, by its appearance in various movies, and uh, it's now a, a little, uh, what do you call it, a, you know, a little uh, uh, in joke in uh, Better Call Saul, if you're watching that. In, uh, uh, at any rate, uh, so there's, you can read about Pimento Cheese in here. But um, now you, you see uh, the 10 best Pimento Cheese sandwiches in New York in New York Magazine, so. <laughs> The world is all crazy. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Other than Felix's, is what are some of your other favorite food haunts in New Orleans? Um, what are my favorite food restaurants in New Orleans? Um, there's a new one called Paladar that um, uh, in the Marigny neighborhood that uh, I had the best pork. This is saying a great deal. I had the best pork chop. I ever had in, in, in that place, Paladar. People don't, it's not overwhelmed yet by, by people. So it's, uh, I recommend that. Uh, there's a, the hot new, pla new places is a place called Shia, which is an Israeli uh, inspired place, which is really, really good. And then there's another one called Kenton's, K E N, I think, T O N, which I haven't eaten at yet. But then there are all the Donald Link, pla Donald Link places like uh, uh, Pesh and um, uh, uh, and um, um, well, uh, formerly owned by Susan Spicer, uh, Herb Saint, and uh, those are all really good. Pesh is really good seafood. Um, then there's always Susan Spicer's Bayona, which uh, is a great place. Um, I'm getting hungrier and hungrier. <laughs> so maybe we better wrap this up, unless anybody's got a really pressing. Um, Question. I will wrap it up with a song to pie, which is uh, on page 280, almost the last page. Pie, oh my, nothing tastes sweet, wet, salty, and dry all at once, so well as pie. Apple and pumpkin and mints and black bottom. I'll come to your place every day if you've got them. Pie. Thank you. <laughs> There are, there are a lot of, a lot, I might point out, there are a lot of things in here that I did not read. So uh, you can find the rest of them for sale, oddly enough, downstairs. Thank you. <laughs>